the future of blockchain technology, the access into cryptocurrency, everything else, Web3, NFTs, all of those different use cases will happen in mobile. Um, we've seen that happen in emerging markets before where you see more and more of um, the actual use usage and use cases really being built on mobile. And so we thought you need a blockchain that's essentially designed for that. Essentially, the way I think of regenerative finance is it's the opposite of extractive finance. Um, and how do you have shared value of that? Crypto is great for that because you have, if we think of normally for, tra for traditional financial systems, you always have an intermediary. And an intermediary's job is to essentially collect value from every financial activity. That means that they're always sitting in the middle and earning fees. But decentralized finance and things in crypto are are different because the actual ownership of that, rather than it going to an intermediary, it goes back to the same people who are providing the mechanisms and means for different types of financial activity. The question, of course, is does the CBDC solve what I think is probably the biggest problem, which is this general lack of wealth? It doesn't because that requires more general government policy change to think about what are the underpinnings of the economy? How is capital flowing? A CBDC itself doesn't solve that. Uh, it only solves kind of some of the conditions of what I think of when it comes to lack of wealth, which is one of the core causes of financial exclusion. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Emerging Voices and Emerging Crypto.io podcast, where we will be segmenting Web3 thought leaders from emerging markets. I'm your host, John Lira, founder of Emerging Crypto.io, your single go to source for Web3 news from emerging markets. We've invited Cello back to Emerging Voices, and today we will be speaking with Nick Hill Ragavira. Head of Strategy and Innovation at the Cello Foundation and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. If you want to learn more about the Cello Foundation, you may go to cello.org. Nick Hill, thank you for joining and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Nick Hill, for the uninitiated, what is Cello? Yeah, so Cello is a layer one blockchain, um, EVM compatible, originally kind of forked from Ethereum, but then heavily optimized for mobile. And the real view on this and the reason why this was done is that we believe that the future of blockchain technology, the access into cryptocurrency, everything else, Web3, NFTs, all of those different use cases will happen in mobile. Um, we've seen that happen in emerging markets before where you see more and more of um, the actual use usage and use cases really being built on mobile. And so we thought you need a blockchain that's essentially designed for that. Uh, and so that's really what Celo is. Uh, it's proof of stake, uh, mobile first, and a heavy emphasis around kind of building regenerative economies. And so what we mean by regenerative economies is uh, different from how we think of extractive financial systems, where how do we build up community models of finance? How do we incorporate things such as climate action into an economic system itself? Uh, how do we think about social, um, social impact use cases as well? Uh, and so that's really what the emphasis of Celo has always been, and heavily around kind of real world use cases, given that mobile uh, emphasis. You're also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. What does a senior fellow do at the Atlantic Council? And what is your research focus at the council? So I'm a non-resident senior fellow. They have both resident fellows and non-resident uh, fellows. And so as a non-resident fellow, I'm not actually located physically at the Atlantic Council office, which is in DC. Uh, but basically what I primarily do is publish different articles, pieces, uh, speak at various events at the Atlantic Council, uh, primarily around digital currency. And so earlier part of my uh, involvement with the Atlantic Council was heavily focused around uh, central bank digital currency. Uh, but then more so recently, it's been kind of uh, permissionless cryptocurrency, uh, those kinds of those kinds of things. So that could be anything related to NFTs or it could be uh, related to cryptocurrency itself, di different types of like DeFi um, and so a lot of that has just been publishing articles and uh, speaking at events. Given that Celo is just one of many blockchains, how did you become aware of Celo? And what stood out to you about the organization that led you to want to be a part of the foundation? So I have to give a little bit of background here. My background prior to Celo is a mix of kind of um, economic consulting, management consulting, but also nonprofit management, um, particularly in the racial justice and the financial inclusion space. And so when I first heard about Celo, it was actually when I was uh, doing my grad school degree, um, where I was doing an MBA and a master's in public administration. And another person in my program actually dropped out and uh, was an early employee at Celo. Um, and so I, how I first heard about Celo was through him, and then also kind of a lot of talk around social impact and financial inclusion use cases and how essentially crypto and blockchain technology could facilitate and make it easier for um, 
access into the financial system to bypass intermediaries. That to me was really exciting. That was how I first heard about Stello. That's what I got really excited by um, and that heavy mission component. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's really how I first heard about Stello was while I was in grad school and then the rest is history. Let's first talk about Cello's recent brand refresh with an emphasis on regenerative finance or refi, because the arc of Cello is an interesting one. It started in 2017 as a protocol for decentralized social payments that made it easy to send and receive crypto payments by using a phone number as a public key and introduce algorithmic dollar Euro and Brazilian real stable coins. Over the next couple of years, the brand evolved and embraced the idea that money should be beautiful with an emphasis on social and economic prosperity. And at the beginning of this year, Cello refreshed its brand with a greater emphasis around refi. Nikhil, first, how has Cello's mission and vision evolved since it was founded? And what are some of the major milestones has Cello achieved? So the interesting part here is I don't actually think the kind of the narrative or the mission evolved at all. Uh, if you go look at the original white paper, um, this was essentially kind of the core underlying thesis for how we were thinking of a blockchain itself. Uh, and so it started with, of course, this mobile, this mobile design. And then from there saying we can actually build stable coins that have an over collateralized mechanism. Now it's uh, kind of backed one to one with USDC and DAI. At the time, it was a different, it was a bit of a different structure based off of really what was in the market and kind of what you could build. Um, so there was that there was an emphasis on mobile architecture and payments, and then there was kind of this in the white paper itself. It's a, there's a lot of talk around social impact use cases, and so that was things such as like cross border remittances, humanitarian aid, demurrage, different types of things of like an actual economic system. And then at the very end, the paper actually also talks about climate use cases and specifically how do you back a financial system uh, with natural capital assets? Um, what we mean by this is, you know, if we think of the history of money, it's, you know, either been, you know, you can take the gold standard was backed by gold. Now it's really backed by the full faith and credit of the Federal Reserve of the United States and you, your trust in like the existence of the U.S. dollar itself. Um, but what was the other concept here was we can actually take especially the stable coins that were kind of natively built on Celo and have them backed by natural capital over time. And the result is if you do that in the same way that in the past, if you back your money with gold, you incentivized kind of the searching and production of gold. In that same case, you're actually able to incentivize the holding and growth of natural capital assets, which is good for the environment. So this is in the white paper. Uh, the challenge, of course, was when the white paper was written, there was no such thing as tokenized uh, natural capital assets and kind of any type of climate use cases. But we've actually seen that change over the last year, year and a half. And so that was where like a lot of that development was able to happen on Celo because we had been thinking about that for a long time. Uh, and so that's kind of been a mix of kind of carbon credits, but then different ways of galvanizing climate action. Uh, and so the rebrand was really kind of meant to was, of course, you have a change in a logo and a kind of change in a design. But I think it was the idea that actually a lot of this is now pieces that were not possible or were not being done before from a technical standpoint are now being done. So how do you have a brand that essentially embraces that and is able to incorporate all of those different pieces together in a way that the previous brand just couldn't because it wasn't really there at the time? Um, so yeah, I would say like that's really been, this arc has kind of always been there. And for that matter, even Cello was launched on Earth Day. So climate wasn't new for us. Uh, and the very first governor, governance proposal we ever had on the Cello blockchain, you know, like we have all kinds of different blockchains that have different governance proposals as their, as their first one. For us, the very first one was actually around um, carbon offsets. Like how do you essentially offset the climate footprint of your blockchain? And how can you do that natively on your blockchain? And how do you have a community architecture around that? Um, so yeah, it's it's always been there. Uh, it just may not have been as front and center before just because of marketing and uh, just what was technically possible. You touched on regenerative economies at the beginning. What is regenerative finance or refi? And you know, how is this kind of built into the larger narrative of decentralized finance? And, and why is this important? Uh, to the greater kind of Web3 ecosystem? In my mind, regenerative finance is essentially how do you link finance to actual output that it's not just, you know, financial actions itself can be good for an economy, good for people, right? If we think of lending, if we think of payments, all of that is finance. 
But then how do you have additional positive externalities in a regenerative system? So how is it that your financial activity is then feeding into other components that are good for the world? And so that could be things such as, you know, like uh, social impact use cases that can be climate. And so how do you have essentially that proliferate and have a better financial system that isn't ex extractive? It's essentially the way I think of regenerative finance is it's the opposite of extractive finance. Um, and how do you have shared value of that? Crypto is great for that because you have, if we think of normally for, tra for traditional financial systems, you always have an intermediary. And an intermediary's job is to essentially collect value from every financial activity. That means that they're always sitting in the middle and earning fees. But decentralized finance and things in crypto are are different because the actual ownership of that, rather than it going to an intermediary, goes back to the same people who are providing the mechanisms and means for different types of financial activity. Uh, and so that's where it's something like DeFi is really important because you can actually have designs of community-based models of finance uh, that aren't possible. So I can give an example here. Uh, a project like Ethic Hub, I think of, or actually a better one would be Grassroots Economics. Grassroots Economics is a community currency project in Africa. And they've basically designed a, a way in which you're saying, hey, like there's all these different facets for how we back a, uh, a currency. And so you and I might, you know, back it based off of the euro or the dollar. But you can also take things such as mutual, mutual networks of like, you know, borrowing and lending or credits and things like that. And how do you back that into a financial system? How do you essentially have an accounting system in which you account for mutual trade and uh, things that are basically within a community of lending that if I know you and you're sitting here uh, in the next door apartment, I might lend you some, th some money for the end of the week. And then I'm expecting you to pay back because I know who you are. I know where you live. Now, how do you link all of those kinds of things into your community currency itself? And how do you have an accounting mechanism around that? That's where you've now created a system in which you're giving accounting value and you're giving additional value to local community trust networks in a financial system. That hasn't happened in a really long time. And that's been done, but it, you can scale it. You have a technical platform with blockchain to actually be able to build that and scale it. Uh, and so that those are the kinds of things we think about. Another really good example is Ethic Hub, where they're looking at lending to farmers. Uh, and so working in farming communities um, and then basically thinking about how do you make it more, how do you make it accessible for farmers to access loans in a way that they normally can't. So that's really how we think of regenerative economies. Let's move on to explore the Web3 ecosystems in the local markets where Celo operates. As the world becomes increasingly interconnected and blockchain poised to impact industries and economies around the globe, I imagine it's critically important to you and Celo to understand the diverse landscape of different regions, their unique challenges and opportunities, and assess the maturity and adoption of Web3 in those markets in order to adapt your strategies to better serve these markets. Nikhil, what are Celo's primary markets that the foundation focuses on, and how do you assess the maturity and adoption of Web3 ecosystems in these markets? So from a global distribution, I think Celo has been most heavily used in Latin America and Africa. Um, so those are places that we do spend a lot of time, as in folks from the Celo Foundation team go there, or we have ambassadors, we have team members. In, in those places. We do have someone in uh, kind of who's our head of LATAM. We have a few different team members uh, across different countries in Africa. And that's where we've seen kind of some of the largest adoption and use cases. Uh, but I think for us, I think a big component from the foundation side is really where does our ecosystem take us? And so if you're starting to see projects building in other parts of the world and uh, they're getting more users, like that is where our ecosystem takes us. And so there's a combination here of sometimes we kind of look at where we want to focus on, but then there's also a component of where is there demand in the ecosystem? And some of that dif differs on what type of use cases. Um, so an example, I, and I think that's where, I think for us, it's kind of seeing where that type of development really goes. And then it's, of course, if you're seeing development in certain parts, you're also making sure you have on and off ramps in those locations. You have uh, a way for people to be able to move seamlessly between crypto and, and fiat. Um, and so it's then providing the infrastructure for that. What unique challenges and opportunities do these local markets present for Celo? Each market's different. Uh, some some places might be you know heavy B two B business to business or um, 
Some of them might be just very kind of end user oriented. And so the use cases differ. You can't have the same model in every place. And I think trying to come from a, so I'm, I'm based out of the United States. If I come in trying to use a US lens in those settings, it, it, may, it oftentimes doesn't work. Uh, there's language barriers. You have to look at local partners, work with local partners. And so it's really actually understanding like what are the compelling use cases for why someone would want to use crypto in those countries. Uh, and so it's being really cognizant of that and kind of relying on local partners rather than trying to parachute in um, and basically trying to trying to do it yourself. And in the same case, we've done a lot of kind of work on new kind of use case launches with with, pro, with kind of larger nonprofits like Grameen, Mercy Corps, the World Food Program, among others, uh, Care International. And so what we do there when we're working on those types of projects is we really rely on local partners on the ground. Um, we see ourselves as like we're helping build out a tech platform or I have expertise in DeFi. So I can say, hey, like here are the things that we can do from a technical standpoint. But the actual implementation, all of that really hinges upon a local partner who is well entrenched in the community, knows who those individuals are and can think about like this works, this won't work uh, and, and navigating it from there. But yeah, I think the, the big point here is every country is different. Every market is different. Um, and there's, you know, some core underlying facets like people want mobile, right? Or internet bandwidth might be an issue, or you have to think about like language barriers always a, can always be a problem um, or just general lack of wealth. Uh, but I think there are differences and nuances within each place to think about. I heard you say local partners a number of time, bandwidth, language, lack of wealth as uh, perhaps some lesson learned and, and best practices working in these markets. What are some other lessons learned or best practices acquired from working within these local Web3 ecosystems? I think it's that you have to have some type of local presence here and you have to be intentional in the way you're going and um, navigating that. If you're coming in with the plan of kind of just trying to recoup value and uh, and leave, it becomes very obvious. And so it is being very intentional around it. And I think over time, it's also how are you building a tech stack that actually supports that? Uh, it's easy in the beginning to just kind of throw money at a solution, uh, throw money at a problem and say, oh, like this is going to just get solved. But I think it then comes down to having a bit more of an intentional roadmap around what are the problems that you're trying to solve? How are you thinking about development? Um, how are you even, how are you designing a blockchain? And so I think it, I think that ends up being really, really crucial uh, when you're looking at kind of different locations. Let's turn and also, our... sorry, the last thing is Excuse actually me. like, and sorry, the last thing is, I think understanding really like what are the core problems? Um, if not, then you're not able to solve it. Let's turn our attention to Cello's product roadmap and explore the strategic direction and key focus, focus areas as the blockchain continues to improve and evolve to stay ahead of the curve and address the needs of its growing community, as well as gain insight into the planning, decision-making, and development process that drives Cello's growth and innovation and get a glimpse into the exciting new developments that lie ahead for the Cello ecosystem. Nikhil, can you give us an overview of Cello's current product roadmap and its key focus areas as the blockchain improves itself and evolves? So the Cello protocol is essentially uh, one of the, con the main contributors to that is C-Labs. Um, and so C-Labs was the original group that built the Cello blockchain. Uh, and then now kind of help support its development. And so they actually recently uh, uh, put out a post on kind of their roadmap and what they're focusing on. So it's a few key components. One is tight alignment with the Ethereum roadmap. And that's because of the history of Celo. It is, we don't see ourselves as uh, a competitor to Ethereum. I think we actually see ourselves working alongside Ethereum, but focusing on different use cases or uh, in a, in a multi-chain world, kind of mobile use cases and some of the more like social impact use cases. Um, so the result of that is a tight roadmap with Ethereum. So what does that mean? Um, one is C-Labs communicated a view that rollups are kind of a longer term, better model for our probably right as of right now, from what we've seen, the best model for thinking about scalability, as well as having kind of different use cases. So let's say someone wants a private, a private blockchain, um, having a rollup design for that. So C-Labs is working on making it easier to uh, build rollups on Celo, uh, which and working with different partners to basically have new rollups for different use cases. The other one is around um, <clears throat> overall blockchain throughput, and so for that, looking at different consensus mechanisms, they're doing research with Mist and Labs to figure out like 
what our mechanisms to basically have Celo, the vision is Celo is the fastest EVM chain out there. Um, and so that's another uh, key component. Another one is around essentially kind of different mechanisms around like we have a decentralized mapping between phone numbers and account addresses. So how do you have that easier to then have like dApps linked to it or different mechanisms that, that aren't just phone number, but other types of identity systems that you can map one-to-one -one or have different components to it. Uh, so the other ones are when we think of the Ethereum roadmap, right now on Celo, you can pay for gas with Celo as well as the uh, mental stable coins, CUSD, C Euro, and uh, C Real. Uh, in this case, so if you want to have a tight roadmap with Ethereum, it's also helpful to be able to pay for gas with ETH. And so it's actually incorporating, uh, there's wormhole wrapped ETH on Celo. And so that would be a first instance where they're actually looking to have uh, wormhole wrapped ETH as an option to pay for gas. That's under development. And then the last uh, item was also just thinking about, or two more items. One was around kind of thinking about the token, the tokenomics itself. Uh, and refine, continuing to refine that. Uh, that's something that I think every L1 has been thinking about over time of how do you kind of build out your token model uh, and kind of evolve it based off of changes in the market. And then the last piece is just general tooling and how does it make, how do you make it easier for developers to be able to build on the Celo blockchain? All right, so that, that was the Celo, uh, that was the Celo roadmap. For those who want to learn a little bit more, there's a bit of a deeper uh, write-up, which check out, which is Google Celo 2.0 roadmap. Well, let's dive into Celo's relationships with businesses and governments and how these partnerships drive the adoption of its technology and foster growth, as well as how the foundation navigates the complex landscape of regulation and security in its interactions with businesses and governments. As blockchain solutions become more widely recognized for their potential to transform industries and improve access to financial services, it's increasingly important for projects like Celo to engage with key stakeholders, including businesses and governments. Nikhil, how does Celo approach building partnerships with businesses and governments to drive adoption of its technology? I'll talk a little bit more heavily on, on businesses um, because I think that's where a lot of our engagement happens. And so in this case with businesses, it's identifying use cases on different things that they might be interested in from a Web3 standpoint. And so those might be things such as customer loyalty, payments, uh, climate use cases. Uh, and so it's basically kind of having those conversations, figuring out what they're looking for, and then looking to see like who in our ecosystem has already built it out, or kind of looking at us with C-Labs building out a component of that or tweaking things. Um, and so it's usually just kind of going around and figuring out like what are things that folks are interested in, as well as leveraging our own networks. Uh, we have a few examples of that as well. And so one is we've done like different use cases, for example, with Care International, which is not a business, but a nonprofit, um, looking at crypto for humanitarian aid. Uh, so we had a report with them. Um, another one, one, another one of our key partners is Kickstarter. Uh, and so they're building kind of a decentralized uh, different model for a crowdfunding platform uh, based off of kind of, for, for, for those of you who don't know, Kickstarter is a B Corp. Uh, so they do have a social impact mission. And so it was a good fit where Kickstarter is looking at how can we have a, a, a different model for crowdfunding and a different type of platform. So they're building that on Celo. Um, and another big example would be Deutsche Telekom, who's one of our close partners. Um, Deutsche Telekom is a mobile kind of telco. And so the result is all things that blo in blockchain for a telco company that might be of interest, we've been exploring that. So that's kind of that can be a mix of payments, it can be identity pieces, it can be um, customer loyalty. We did a hackathon with them earlier this year. Um, and so it's kind of that full that full arsenal of what you can do from a Web3 stack. I was reading this morning about Celo's collaboration with Google Cloud. What yeah. can we expect from this partnership? Yeah, that one would just happened uh, a few days, that one would just was announced a few days ago. Uh, the first piece here is really thinking about cloud credits and how are we supporting the development of climate, a lot of climate related projects on the Celo blockchain, but more generally. And so I think from a Google infrastructure standpoint, they kind of provide cloud credits and other types of infrastructure tooling for developers. That's the first step, but we are actually working on a few other pieces, kind of particularly around climate um, that aren't public yet, but will be announced in, uh, I think in the next few weeks. So uh, more to come on that front. What have been some of the regulatory compliance and security concerns ex expressed in meetings with businesses in the market Celo operates in? And how do you address these concerns when working with these entities? 
so for us, I think it's taking a very risk averse approach to uh, thinking about compliance and, and regulation. So making sure that we are fully compliant as a foundation, uh, obviously we can't match the compliance of every other entity in the Celo ecosystem, given that anyone can build on the Celo blockchain. But from our end as a foundation, it is you know making sure that we are very robust in our compliance and our due diligence process, making sure that the things that we're funding or even kind of focusing on, the things that we even say um, aren't things that might be seen as uh, as potentially uh, problematic. Um, and you know, even for like any partnerships or anything that we announce on our Twitter, even or anything like that, it's doing the due diligence beforehand. It's being firm that hey, like we actually might not partner with a group that doesn't pass due diligence, and that's happened before, where we had concerns around kind of we had their compliance check, and there were problems that came up, and we said, hey, actually, this would have been a big partnership, but unfortunately, we're not able to move forward on this. Uh, and so I think it's having that type of approach. Um, and just being really, really forthcoming. And I think uh, some of our team has kind of a really good background in in policy and uh, in regulatory affairs. And so that's been really helpful because they have a good read on the pulse. And I think at the end of the day, it just means kind of being a good actor, being very particular on what things you do and what things you don't do, what you fund, what are the things you say, uh, can you be the adult in the room? Um, and sometimes even just telling a partner, hey, do you, this is something we can't do. Uh, and that's happened before too, where they're like, oh, we want to do this. And it's like, well, it sounds good in theory, but like, we're not comfortable doing it, at least not as a foundation. Someone else might be, but we're not comfortable at the Sella Foundation to do some of these uh, things. So I think it's working in that setting. And I think as you kind of build up that type of relationship with businesses or others, um, you're known for for being a good actor and being trustworthy and doing the best doing the best that you can in what I think overall is a market in which there's not been a lot of regulatory clarity. Uh, from, particularly by U.S. entities, uh, and so essentially having to navigate that. Our last topic is central bank digital currencies, a topic that has gained significant attention in the last couple of years. This is a subject that I would consider you an expert on, given your work on CBDCs at the Atlantic Council. And you're someone who could speak to the exciting ways that CBDCs can improve access to financial services and the concerns that some people have around financial surveillance. Nick Hill, financial inclusion is often referred to as a key benefit to implementing a CBDC. What are some of the root causes of financial exclusion and how can CBDCs resolve some of these problems? So some of the root causes of financial exclusion, the biggest one, quite frankly, is actually oftentimes this lack of wealth. If, if someone doesn't have enough money and is living paycheck to paycheck, they probably don't have a bank account because they don't need it. Uh, so that's a big one. Other components are, you know, access to banks or access the actual like existence of financial institutions where they live. So if you don't have strong financial institutions, it's very difficult to even be finan financially included in a system. Um, another one is kind of just education, understanding of how kind of different financial tools work. Uh, that's a, that's another big, that's another big hurdle. And so um, when we think of a CBDC, the difference here is you have two different types of CBDCs. You have a wholesale and a retail. So it's important to distinguish that because this has probably come up recently. If anyone were to go read any recent developments on CBDCs, this is actually being actively talked about. A wholesale CBDC is one which is built by a central bank, as is any, uh, as is any CBDC, but it's primarily being used by financial institutions. Um, and so that would be, you know, interbank payments between one bank and another or, um, the issuance of money itself from a central bank over to kind of private financial institutions, such as, you know, the, the JP Morgans, HSBCs, Goldman Sachs of the world. That's a wholesale. Retail is different. Retail is a CBDC that is actually then used by kind of citizens or people. Uh, and so the way for that is you need some type of digital wallet uh, as an individual. And then you now have a CBDC that you can go and use for payments. You can, you know, deposit that into your bank account, your bank account. When you withdraw money, you can send it to your CBDC digital wallet. So when we think of financial inclusion, it, it comes down to that retail CBDC, it comes down to the CBDC that's being used by everyday people. For that, the mechanisms around financial inclusion for, for those pieces are are you now able to give people access, essentially access to a bank account in which they couldn't before because they have, um, because they may not have access to a bank account where they live. So have you been able to give them that? 
um, have you bypassed certain intermediaries that other financial institutions that may actually not even allow people to have an account, um, you know, for like overdraft reasons, or you need to have a minimum balance. A lot of banks have minimum balance requirements, which if you don't have that minimum balance, you're going to get charged a penalty. But a CBDC, if it's an account with the central bank, which is what this would be, it would be a little different. So you're basically giving everyone a bank account is, is what it comes down to. Um, and then the other one is, do you now have a digital mechanism for payments? Um, and is that actually easier to send money between people? So can someone who's not even located right in your neighborhood, can someone else send you money? Or can you still be able to facilitate business trans business or personal transactions? To have this actually work for financial inclusion, though, uh, it has to, I think, in my mind, have a mobile component to it. If not, you've not really solved that last mile issue. You're not reaching probably the people who need it the most. Um, the other one is, can it operate in low bandwidth areas? Uh, if you have a system, I don't know if like I use Venmo or you know Cash App or anything like that. If you're in a place that you don't have internet, it doesn't work, whereas Cash works. Uh, and so you actually need something that's able to operate in low bandwidth or have some type of design in which it still can. Um, the other one is around, I think, from a financial inclusion standpoint, the other component is, can that actually fit into your overall financial history? So if you're primarily paying in cash, you're not building any form of financial history, which means that you're not able to get access to other forms of capital. You can't access a micro loan. You can't access a traditional loan. Um, you can't access a lot of other financial products. But in this case, a CBDC, can that fit into a data architecture so that you can then access a broader array of financial uh, tools? That becomes really important. And so those are some of the ways that if we think of financial inclusion, there's ways to design for that. The question, of course, is does the CBDC solve what I think is probably the biggest problem, which is this general lack of wealth? It doesn't because that requires more general government policy change to think about what are the underpinnings of the economy? How is capital flowing? A CBDC itself doesn't solve that. Uh, it only solves kind of some of the conditions of what I think of when it comes to lack of wealth, which is one of the core causes of financial exclusion. How can regulators and policymakers go about achieving financial inclusion with the CBDC and ensure that financial inclusion is a part of the design and implementation? Yeah, so one of them is, as I mentioned earlier, or uh, two of the things I mentioned earlier are, you know, like mobile design as well as um, um, <clears throat> um, low band, being able to op operate in low bandwidth. Those are kind of two pieces. But I think from a regulator and a policymaker standpoint, it's actually thinking about, okay, so you're, issue, you're having a CBDC. Now, how does that fit into a broader economic transformation? Uh, and so then thinking about that from a standpoint of it's not just a CBDC by itself to solve like what you're thinking of financial exclusion, but actually you need to have a broader comprehensive component there. And so CBDC is really helpful for these other pieces, right? So cash aid, for example, uh, if we think of COVID times, a number of governments that were sending kind of um, a COVID relief package really struggle to send that money out to people. Um, whereas the CBDC is much, much easier for that because you now have kind of essentially a centralized mechanism and a tech stack to essentially be able to do that. And so things such as when we think of um, kind of uh, cash aid, humanitarian aid, those kinds of components, you're able to actually incorporate, incorporate that in a much better fashion to then kind of solve what I mentioned earlier, which is one of the core problems of, of just lack of wealth. Uh, and so I think it's kind of really emphasizing that just having this technical piece doesn't solve a lot of those real underlying problems. There's other pieces there. If you had kind of a healthy economy, private sector could have also potentially built out the same thing as a CBDC. Um, in the same way that oftentimes in the US, you have a lot of, in Europe, you have a lot of uh, fintech companies that are able to service and fulfill the roles of what a CBDC might but a CBDC in other countries might actually be needed because you don't have the other technical components. You don't have that private sector to fill in and provide some of that support. Um, and so in that case, then from a policymaker standpoint, it should actually be thinking about a CBDC in and of itself isn't going to solve all your problems. Now it's one tool within a, within a set of different tools that you should probably use or consider using. And so it's kind of going a little bit deeper and thinking about what are the core problems that you're really trying to solve. I watched one of your webinars at the Atlantic Council, and you also talked about the importance of policymakers and CBDC you know, framework designers be embedded in the communities or have a presence in the communities that are being financially excluded. Could you talk a little bit more about that as well? 
it's yeah, this is a problem that happens both in government as well as private sector uh, is you want to solve some some big some big problem, right? You know that it's a big problem and you, you think it's and you know it's important um, and you're very, very you're presumably well intentioned on it. Let's assume the well intentioned well intentioned component. Uh, if you're trying to operate in, let's say, in Washington, D.C., but you're thinking about payments in the rural American South, or if you're thinking about, um, let's say, payments in in Berlin, but you're thinking about kind of a rural part of Germany, or even we've seen this happen in the European Union, right, where the, the European Central Bank thinks of one thing, but then and Germany might think of one thing, but then another European country will have a very different view around it. It's not because they're, they're it's because the actual underlying conditions might be different. And so when we're thinking about a more inclusive tech design, you have to actually be wedded in those communities to really understand what are those core problems. It just comes down to design thinking and what is a good way of thinking about development. If you're too far removed, you're going to build around your view of the world and where you're located, but that is not the same as someone else. Uh, we've done a lot of work with IDEO, where, um, which is a design consulting group. And for them, it's how do you kind of go and do a lot of customer or like end user surveys and end user feedback and build something that is actually easier for them to use. And so those are things such as like, even from a UX standpoint, does the UX you built, does that make sense? Does it not make sense? Maybe it makes sense for you in, in one location, but not for someone else. Um, and so I think otherwise you're kind of anticipate, if you're building from like based off of your own view of from like a city or from like a more affluent part of the world, you're essentially assuming some type of trickle down happens over time rather than a pure bottom up if you're trying to solve those end problems. Um, and it's the same thing in kind of nonprofit world as well. You should be working as closely and as engaged in those communities you're really trying to serve as possible. So that's that's really how I thought about it from, from that standpoint and something that I think is crucial for anything in digital currency that we have to build with the end user in mind uh, rather than our own our own view in mind. Financial inclusion versus financial surveillance. Is it realistic that central banks would deploy a retail or wholesale CBDC that provides the end user the privacy they want and deserve when conducting day-to-day -day transactions along with the technological benefits that come with the CBDC? Or are we going to have to accept and live with that there will be some spectrum of financial surveillance in a post-CBDC world? I think there are ways of having a more private, uh, privacy-focused CBDC. Now, the question is, do governments do it or not? Um, I think we've seen uh, China, for example, at least that's uh, from some of our findings at the Atlantic Council, it, a lot of it has been around like building a financial system, but then also there are uh, surveillance components to it. Uh, and then this has been a very active topic in the United States where um, how, how private is your CBDC? So there are, ways that, there are ways of doing it. And I mean, there's different kind of security models, zero knowledge proofs, things like that, that you can actually incorporate. And the question is, is do they or do they not? Um, it's really important. And then this comes down to really this underlying question then of if a government doesn't have a privacy focused CBDC that doesn't incorporate surveillance mechanisms, does that require then for cryptocurrency to be really the alternative for it? Um, I see a world in which CBDCs and cryptocurrency can operate interchangeably, that you can move seamlessly between a crypto and a CBDC because cryptocurrencies often fulfill other purposes as well. It's not just oftentimes just a form of payment, but there's other components to it, especially when you think of programmable money. Um, whereas a CBDC, it's not the case. Um, so I think it really will come down to what are the privacy implications around it. And in the same way, I think we have this problem right now in traditional fintech of how much of your data is really private when you're using a payment system Op operated by a fintech. It's not very private. A lot of that data is actually being collected. Um, so I think there's a unique opportunity from a CBDC standpoint to say, hey, we can actually have an alternative to other fintech companies that are incentivized to collect data. Every fintech company is, is, is incentivized to collect uh, data, whereas the government is not necessarily in the same way, not from a financial standpoint. Uh, and so there's an opportunity to really build out a more privacy-focused uh, CBDC that fulfills what cash oftentimes does, which is uh, peer to peer payments and cash are private. Uh, no one can really track it. And I think that there is an opportunity to do that. The question, of course, is will, will governments do it? Well, we're just about at time. Last question about your thoughts and vision for the future emerging markets, 
climate change and regenerative finance are all factors that will undoubtedly shape the direction of projects like Celo and the broader refi ecosystem. According to the World Economic Forum, 10% of global GDP is projected to be stored on blockchain by 2027, four years from now. As we see an increased focus on financial inclusion, there is a growing need for solutions tailored to the unique challenges faced by emerging markets, where over 1.7 billion people still remain unbanked, according to the World Bank. At the same time, there's a global push towards addressing climate change and innovative solutions under the umbrellas of regenerative finance and decentralized finance that have the potential to offer more accessible transparent and efficient financial services. Nikhil, how do you envision the future of Celo and the future of ReFi and their impact on financial inclusion and contribution to slowing down climate change in the next five to 10 years? So all the, so many of the different problems you just mentioned are, it really comes, so much of it comes down to a collective action problem. How do we have collective action around social impact use cases or a better financial system that's kind of more oriented towards end users that is accessible. Uh, how do we think about climate action and how do you have a collective action around that, which is probably the biggest challenge around climate action actually is the lack of the, just a challenge of, of driving collective action. Blockchain technology is actually really powerful for that because you actually have a tech stack that's built for consensus. That's how everything operates. Uh, and so if you have a tech stack that is built for consensus and you're creating an ecosystem that cares about these issues, you're actually able to start driving collective action towards those key problems. Uh, and so for Celo, it is, we have a multi-chain view and we see a world in which you have different blockchains uh, fulfilling different purposes. And so for us, it is, you know, solving those like big hairy, dash, big hairy problems in the world of uh, thinking about what is really needed as a more regenerative financial system. Uh, and so the way we see that is kind of two components, building a tech stack around that as well as building an ecosystem around that. Um, and I think that's where it's continuing to support different projects and developers around the world, build on the Celo blockchain, making it easier for people to be able to move seamlessly between Celo and other blockchains and traditional fiat. Can you, we have a mechanism, we have, we've done a lot of work around on-ramps and off-ramps. How do you go back and forth between crypto and, and non-crypto? And can you do that with a phone rather than having to be on your computer? Um, all those kinds of different infrastructure. Uh, same for climate action. Do you have different mechanisms for measurement, reporting, and verification of carbon credit assets, which are, which has been a big problem in traditional in the traditional carbon offset world? Of how do you actually know if that asset that you're using that's meant to represent your offset that you're retiring for your carbon footprint is that real or is that not real? Is it really kind of is the underlying value of that actually based off of like um, climate action, or is it not? And this has been a big problem from a transparency standpoint. So how do we build in natively and how do we kind of have the measurement reporting and verification that's transparent and visible and feeds directly into your carbon credit asset? How do you galvanize climate action more generally? And how do you fit that into your underlying economic systems itself, into your underlying DeFi protocols? Those are kinds of things that we are exploring heavily and we're spending a lot, our ecosystem is spending a lot of time working on. I think that's different than other, than other ecosystems. And there's an important use case for that. So then you get into a world in which you have different blockchains, different cryptocurrencies, you, you have potentially CBDCs. The way for us at Celo is how are we building a more um, kind of a better financial system in which others can essentially tap into and be part of. Nick Hill. Thank you very much for being a guest on the show and sharing your insights and perspectives. To stay up to date on the exciting developments coming out of the Cello Foundation, you may go to cello.org. That does it for today's episode of Emerging Voices and EmergingCrypto.io podcast. I'm John Lira. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching this episode of Emerging Voices. If you enjoyed our content, please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. And to stay up to date with what's happening in Web3 from emerging markets, we produce a five-minute, once-a-week newsletter recapping the week's Web3 news from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe to help you stay informed and stay smart. Link to get access is in the description. And before you go, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks again, and see you soon.